Hello, and welcome to Just Another Real Estate Podcast, where we'll speak with Arizona's most successful real estate professionals to better understand their business, current market conditions, team and business building strategies, successes, and challenges. This podcast is brought to you by Dwell Inspect Arizona with your host, Sean Garvey. This is the first episode of Just Another Real Estate Podcast. Uh, my guest today is John Hogue, who is not only a business partner in the real estate industry, but a, a become a friend over the time. Um, John, your business is called Phoenix Desert Dwellings. How'd you come up with that name? Gosh, that's a great question, and I don't have a good answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was on a team for several years, and when I when I branched out and wanted to start my own thing, um, I have a lot of past experience with advertising and branding and marketing. And so I wanted something just kind of that that could flow with a branding in the future and kind of represented, I guess, what we were doing. But I always felt like there was a lot of cheesy names out there and I wanted to, mine might be cheesy too, but. No, I don't think it's cheesy at all. I think it looks great. Um, you're also really known for taking pictures on Instagram of your shoes and then <laughs> tiles as you're, as you're touring houses. Uh, what has attracted you to that kind of posting? Um, Why did you decide to go in that direction? Uh, honestly, I probably saw somebody else do it. And I was like, oh, that's fun. <laughs> <clears throat> and then I paid attention to me doing it and was like, oh, I could. Yeah, floor is fun. Floor is fun. <laughs> and And the reaction was... I mean, at a certain point, I was like, oh, maybe I should stop that. That's silly. And everyone's like, boy, I just don't see those feet and tile photos anymore. What's up with that? I was like, that's what you liked, huh? No, I think it's great. Content, yeah. I think it's really reflective of of your style and and it helps. Um, I've happened to see some of your flip projects as you're redeveloping houses. And and that's one of the things you seem to take a lot of pride in is is that design aspect of of the house, um, specifically in the tiles and and in the bathrooms, which makes a big difference. That's my favorite part of uh, favorite part of flipping houses for sure. Favorite part of any house is design and what you can do with it. Um, yeah, I think a house is. I mean, it's a, it's so few people realize like it's a shell, you know. And you, especially a buyer perspective, you're looking at like, oh, I really want it to look perfect or whatever you have in your mind. And it's like this, you're gonna fill it with all your stuff then you can play around with it and create what you want. But the house itself is for the most part, you know, unique exceptions aside, um, they're just a shell, you know? That's interesting. Um, And I think we're a touch ahead where I wanted to be, but I want to dive into that a little bit tighter. Like when you're, you flipped a number of houses and I think that's something that a lot of people are really interested in, in flipping houses, especially with, um, you know, every HGTV show that comes out that that has to do with flipping. Um, how do you select the shell and how do you select if it's the right deal? Is it about just math or is it about math and maybe some feel of the structure? Um, for sure, math is the first part of it, right? Like acquisition expenses, renovation expenses, because <clears throat> it's got to be, you know, you don't want to spend several months um, of time and money just to just to lose, you know, like just to do it for fun. Um, but we never chased like massive gains. A lot of it was reasonable, um, reasonable returns. And a lot of it's area, you know, so we've done a couple flips in Glendale where I grew up and you start to get a little bit of nostalgia being around there, a little bit of pride in um, improving the area and improving houses. Similarly, Central Phoenix, where I live now, we've done several that are the mid-century, um, similar age to my house, 50s, 60s, that have a good vibe. And it's kind of the same thing where you're looking at, you know, you, you've you inspected several or most of these for us. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. And, um, we're, you know, you, you want those, everybody, the good bones. Sure. Right? So, but I think there's potential for every house. I would, I would just as easily have fun flipping, I think, a, like a McMansion in Gilbert, because I think there's an expectation for what those should look like. We haven't done one, I don't think, um, 
of those, but I think you could really transform it in a cool way. Again, going back to the shell thing, like if you want a mid-century house, you don't have to buy something from the 50s or 60s necessarily. Interesting. Um, and you've, you've probably hit a lot of buyers who think they want an old house until the inspection. For sure. And they're like, yeah. oh my gosh, everything's old. And you're like, yeah, it's, a, it's an old house. Yeah, I call, yeah. I call that the, everybody wants to do when they're remodeling a house, I call it the fun money. Um, you know, that, that's where they're buying countertops, cabinets, um, appliances, but nobody wants to do the unfun money, which is plumbing, um, uh, wiring, um, mm -hmm. roofs, anything structural. And so at the end of the day, um, you know, the newer houses give you that shell with the kind of good bones, the real good bones, and you don't have to do the unfun money. But I think if you're going to do a flip with a product that people um, enjoy for a long period of time, part of that regeneration is doing some of the unfun money and then, and then some doing some, a lot of the fun money to create the tile and the persona and the character and the charm Yeah. Um, in that. Um, thank you for your insight on that. Let's go back. What, what is Phoenix desert dwellings? Um, and you're primarily a real estate sales team. Mm -hmm. Um, do you have an area of, of Phoenix or the general Phoenix area that you, that you focus on or, um, uh, primarily central Phoenix, I suppose. So, so me and my partner, Sharon, were born and raised here. Mm -hmm. So with that, it's like I've lived in Glendale, lived in Peoria, lived in Tempe, went to ASU, um, and you know, now in Central Phoenix. So we know the Valley really, really well, and I like serving the whole Valley. Sure. Um, primarily, we love both my partner and I live in Central Phoenix now. She's a little further north in kind of the Moon Valley area, mm -hmm. and. It, we just find good character here. I mean, this is where I spent so much of my time. I obviously went to high school in central Phoenix too. We spent a lot of time around here. Um, it's a lot fun of fun fact, houses. John and I didn't know each other in high school, but we did end up going to the same high school. Mm -hmm. You were a yeah. class of 82. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> uh, sure. We don't have to, we don't, have, yeah, we don't have to divulge our real numbers. No, I, that's fine. 1998. There you go. <laughs> Um, what, uh, what draws you into Phoenix? Um, you know, I, I've always said that I, I really love Phoenix. I like the desert. Um, but, um, in the past and when it was really youthful, um, it was, it's kind of a quote unquote boring or safe place. Um, you know, a lot has changed in the last decade, I think. Um, what are you seeing as far as progress and, and what draws you into Phoenix or to stay here? Yeah. Cause you've been um... away have been away and actually you, you just touched on it. I moved to California um, in my early twenties. I moved back in 2012 and I moved downtown with a buddy of mine, which growing up here downtown was not a place to go. No. Unless you were going to a son's game or a baseball game. Um, so moving down there and starting to see some of the growth in the building and just businesses moving in, that was wildly alluring because I was moving from LA Sure. <clears throat> moving from this big city back to a place that I had left because it really wasn't what I wanted, but watching it transform into a bigger city, which a lot of people don't like because they remember the old suburban, simple Phoenix. Um, but I think the growth is good. And, and I think it's cool to watch not only downtown, but it started to spread. Right. And for sure, the history of central Phoenix, right. All these houses built, pre-World War II in the, in the 20s and 30s, a lot of mid-century where we're at, um, and a lot of new construction, obviously, mm -hmm. with, with a lot of the empty lots, which is cool to see. But um, just watching it transform. I mean, we've literally seen it for, for 30 years become something different while still being much the same. I still live in what people would consider like grandma's neighborhood. Right, you know? for sure, yeah. This era of, of home and... Um, just the whole feel and vibe. And it's just cool to see that. I mean, we're also in kind of a cool Mecca of restaurants and art and feel like there's a lot to do in a very centralized area while still, still feeling a bit suburban, still feeling like Phoenix proper. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's, um, 
it's expanded well in the last decade. And, and, and when I tell people, um, you know, as they're introducing their house, I'm getting to know them, finding out where they're from. Um, it's hard to believe, but not too long before 1980, Shea Boulevard was a dirt road. Um, and that always kind of blows your mind, but um, it it's really a brand new city um, and it's expanded out and now it's coming back and starting to go up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but you're, you're right on with the pockets of good restaurants and um, it's really becoming a food city. Um, you have all the sports at your fingertips and, you know, where you live, uh, being in central Phoenix, you're, you're probably what, 20 minutes from any airport and get, can get to anywhere Pretty in much the U.S. Anywhere. really quickly. Yeah. Um, how'd you get into real estate? How did you know you wanted to be a real estate agent and start a real estate business? Um, you know, when I hated my last job. <laughs> uh, actually, so it's, it goes way back when I was, my mom's been in, um, real estate in one way or another, I think since I, as long as I can remember, she did home warranties. She worked in 1031 exchanges, um, eventually got her license. When I was in college, we bought and flipped a couple houses. I was managing kind of the de facto property manager of some of those. Um, but I remember even being little and we'd go to like open houses. And we had a house. I, we weren't looking for a new house, but she was just like, let's go to these open houses. Look, here it is. Um, and, and you're we kicking tires like, or just looking just for opportunities? Kick, yeah, just or... kicking around. No, we were literally just something to do. Um, but I remember that. I remember that, like, enjoying that and that being fun. And then we bought some properties in college when I was at ASU and rented those out. I, I went with an agent to find some of those properties. Um, and kind of decide rental rates, I collected rents, all that fun stuff. Mm. So I got into that a bit. And I wish, honestly, I, it, shortly after that, I moved to California to pursue music. I really wish at that time I had put two and two together and got a license in California. Sure. And at least started that because I was playing music and touring and I needed something flexible. I just, I never put the pieces together. Um, so I didn't do that. I got into retail management mostly which was still really good and learned just an incredible amount. Um, but when I had hit a ceiling there with retail management, the first mm -hmm. thing, the first thing that came to my mind was real estate. Real estate. Like, yeah. We were, we were flipping houses again at that point as the market. You were still we were in LA or Phoenix? Uh, had come back to Phoenix. Okay. So I'd come back and was still managing um, some retail stores here we were flipping houses and I was getting involved in the design aspect of that mostly. Mm -hmm. Then it just seemed like the natural progression of a, an industry where there was no ceiling. I could work with people. I really wanted to work with people. Right. Um, flexibility and freedom, which I've kind of always had for the most part and always want. Yeah. Um, and it just seemed like a, like the right opportunity. And I think it was, I think I, I think I made the right choice. Yeah. I think you've been doing great. Um, you've really made an impact and, and it's been fun watching you grow your business and your team. Um, what are some resources that you use that you found to be helpful as you transitioned out of retail management? I'm sure retail management helped a lot with structure and creating plans and, um, you know, developing your business. Um, but what are some other resources that you use? that help with that? Um, honestly, the biggest was, was partners like, you know, like you. Yeah. Right. Um, but a lender that I met really early on and have developed a similar relationship to you and I, he's one of my good friends. Now we talk often, we do a lot of business together. I trust him. Um, and I talk to him on an almost daily basis. Uh, same with title rep, which um, we've got a great one now, but I've always been pretty close with our title reps and kind of in the fold with that. Um, home insurance, financial advisors, been able to build all these people around um, right. that really are good resources as far as different angles. You know, like it's, it's I don't think real different estate's needs. an industry. Yeah, it, you, you can't come at it from just, I'm selling houses, here's the market, here's how things are. There's a For lot sure. of minutia around it. Um, and so having those, <clears throat> excuse me, having those partners and those people, I think is 
it helped me grow and helped my education grow. Um, I really had when I first started um, and was working with Coldwell Banker, the office vibe there was was very tight. There was a lot of experienced and long term agents. Tight like buttoned up or tight like um, tight like friends. Tight like people went into the office like often, talked yeah, often. Yeah, click. Yeah. I mean. A, yeah. little, a little clicky, yeah. Um, okay. Not in a negative way. Um, but that was really good because I got to go into an office every day and immerse myself with people who knew what they were doing. Professionals. Professionals. Yeah. Um, who were also excited. I mean, I was like welcomed with open arms as kind of a younger demographic at that time, mm. you know, and just got, I mean, a lot of good conversations, a lot of watching how different agents ran their business. And it's like, there wasn't a, you know, one way to do it. There's not one right way for sure. Or endless amounts of ways. So that was nice. You know, it was good to get in and, and absorb all that the first year or two. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and I mean, you, you hear people um, harp on it, but you're the aggregate of your five closest people. And you, it sounded like, you know, your experience at Coldwell Banker brought you around five really good people or so um, in that group. Yep. Um, which could help propel you. Uh, I specifically remember when I met you and, and you helped to launch and propel my business too. Um, we met at the coffee shop on 32nd and Shea after a home mm -hmm. tour, um, which I had sponsored. And that was pretty early into my business. And um, I think you, you took a flyer on me and our team uh, and, and helped spread our business and, and, you know, a relationship realtor and home inspector relationship is of course, um, is, is of course important. Um, you have to have a lot of trust when you refer us over to your clients, not that, that, that we're the best, you know, um, and when we sincerely appreciate that. And so, you know, I took, I take that with a lot of pride that you, that you, tried us out and then continue to keep trying and, and using us um, in conjunction with your real estate business um, or, or selecting us as an opportunity for your clients to use us. Of course. Um, so you thank you. Good, good partnership. It's, you know, those are crucial. For sure. Crucial. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what's the biggest misconception people have about real estate agents? I think this could be a fun one because there's a lot this of them out is, there. <laughs> there are a lot of them out there. I was thinking about that one. Um, I, the first thing that came to my mind was that it's easy and that anyone can do it. Okay. Uh, I think anyone can do it if, yeah. if they really wanted to, <clears throat> but I think it's obvious that it's not um, for everyone or in, or in different capacities. You know, I mean, it really is, there's, there is building a business aspect, right? Like every agent you, you, hang your license with a brokerage, but a lot of times you're trying to build your own brand, which is you for the most part, or eventually maybe a team. Right. You can do that a hundred different ways. But, you know, I think even the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of new agents get in and, and get in when the timing was, I would have thought it was hard uh, becoming an agent in the last couple of years. I would have hated it. But I yeah. think a lot of people did well and got in and now maybe we're starting to see the market shift a little bit and we'll see how they do. Um, but I think there's a lot of people there that, that got in thinking it was easy um, or even clients, you know, you hear that a lot. You get that with a lot of like for sale by owners. Cause they're like, I can mm -hmm. sell my house. I know what to do. Right. And there's a quite a bit more to it. And I think the education aspect that we go through is so much more than what people know or understand or, you know, on the East Coast, they have you have to use a lawyer. We don't have that here because we go yeah, through some of sure. that training, we mm -hmm. go through contract law and stuff like that. And um, I think that's just a that that's probably the biggest misconception I can think of, at least that I notice just on a daily basis. Yeah, that's cer certainly interesting. And and you you bring up a a pretty solid point too that that um, it has been an interesting last couple of years. Um, I was thinking about that prior to our discussion right now, because um, there's an article out that, that, and we briefly talked about this just before we started recording, but um, approximately 15% of all houses under contract fell out of contract. And that's the largest number since April of 2020. 
And so I started thinking about that in the last two years, in April of 2020, it went from a pretty good, healthy real estate market to nothing. Um, nobody sold, everybody canceled contracts, the stock market plunged. Um, they shut the entire US down for two weeks and said, don't even go outside. Um, think about that, right? And then, mm -hmm. and then business started trickling back in and then it was an absolute um, rush. So you went from nobody selling any houses to, you know, they should just shut us all down for two weeks to um, we're going to do this thing and everybody's going to wear masks on and we adapted and went um, digital and virtual. Uh, it was only a couple of months here. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was short prop. Yeah. I mean, especially Nate compared to nationwide. Nationwide. And then, and then you got into a point where interest rates were nothing. And then um, all of California decided to move here at the exact same time. <laughs> So <laughs> then you're working with buyers who, who go from, or a seller can't sell a house to a buyer that has to compete with 50, 60, 75 people, um, you know, offers were crazy. And then um, here we are, we're theoretically talk, um, right at the peak of it. Interest rates have doubled in, in two months and now things are starting to decline. So in two years, you've had to make some serious shifts in your business um, mm -hmm. and adjust through there. Um, so that's pretty pretty wild and you know uh, a misconception that it's easy is is not true because you've had to adapt your business quite a bit in the last two years and we'll have to adapt going back again yeah yeah we'll have to adapt one more time which i think is where it's helpful that we were doing well in business prior to 2020 <clears throat> because it, we're shifting back to that i mean i don't think at least sure. statistically what everybody's kind of talking about is we're looking to hopefully get back into what we saw pre-pandemic which was a strong, reasonable market. Right. Interest rates were reasonable. Not, I mean, still pretty close to where they are now. I mean, we were, yeah, we were only about a point slowly below. going down. Yeah. Um, and, but now we've got prices that are, you know, quite a bit higher, but that's, that's the nature of values, right? You want them to go up for sure. You know, you want your house to be worth more. We just had it yeah, happen it, all at once. In reality, it's got to go up a reasonable amount otherwise you know we're we're talking 80 percent in three four years um and yeah. the housing market at least in desirable areas um and even undesirable undesirable areas becomes unaffordable um and we want people to have homes over their heads and we want them to be safe and they um and we want them to be buying homes and having equity in the market mm -hmm. um so that lends the thought to a possible retraction in price right um, sure. Do you think we'll see um, regret from people that are buying at, at the seemingly top of it? Um, and then part B of that question, that'd be part A. Part B would be, um, what about all the people that waived um, the home inspection, all these concessions to get in there? And what do you think might happen out of that? Um, I think you're going to see that, obviously. I mean, I think you're going to get people, and there's always people that are going to regret because I think those are the people who... Sure. Want their cake and to eat it too. They want, you know, they want the lowest interest rate, the lowest price. And if they don't get it, they're probably going to be upset and think back on it. I, I don't, you know, I think that's absolutely the wrong way to look at it. You know, we talk a lot about yeah. your primary residence. You have to pay, you know, you're going to have to pay, whether it's renting, buying, you're paying to have a roof over your head. Right. You're either paying yourself or someone else in that scenario. Um, and if it was the right move at the time, then be happy with that move. You know, be happy with that choice. If you made the wrong choice or feel like you made the wrong choice, all you can do is learn from it a little bit, you know, for your next venture. But I think, I think the mindset of regret or that it could have been different is just, you're going to say that all the time. Right. You know, and if anybody who waited, you know, we start talking about, values or pricing going down <clears throat> what if they keep going down you know some of these people bought when it was going up and so maybe they saw a fifty thousand dollar increase in equity right away right in like six months if you bought six months ago you might have seen that Crazy. yeah and now you might see a loss of that a little bit was that still a bad move i don't know or what if you bought now and then it keeps going down it's it's always going to be fluctuating but as long as it's your primary residence 
um, or even a long-term investment, like a long-term holding, you just have to understand that's the nature of the market. Well, in reality, for the people too, um, who bought at, you know, maybe it's gone up 50,000 and maybe it comes back down, but they're still in at 3% or below 3%. And then yeah. now the current market rate or the, the um, power of buying with interest at 6% has dropped. Um, what would your long-term advice be for somebody who's bought in at 6%? Um, you know, do they, do they go the course? What if their house drops down um, 50 grand or, or um, you know, what, what would their options be moving into the future to improve oh, I their mean, situation? Yeah, I think, um, great question. I think there's so many, there, there are a lot of different elements, right? When you think about what you got into, like you said, if, if maybe you paid the most, but you have the lowest interest rate, is right. that still, you're still winning, right? Right. Long-term, if you got in at a bad interest rate, especially keep close with a lender. Yeah. You know, hopefully you were able to work with one that you liked during your purchase, but stay close to them and stay close to the market because if you're able to get on a path, same with buying a home, like have a plan, maybe you need to raise your credit rate, you know, yep. your credit score. Um, maybe you need to stuff some money here, pay some things off there. If you have that plan and you're able to refinance coming up when that's, and if, and when that's an option, when the rates drop, yeah. When the rates drop, um, that's good. Also kind of follow the market, follow what's hopefully again, you're close with your agent. Maybe you're like, yeah. Hey, maybe monthly, keep me, keep me up to speed. That's nothing for, I mean, it would take me five minutes maybe to just run comps every time and send them over to you once a month if you wanted. Yeah. yeah. Just so you know, it's in the loop. I think being informed is just kind of the number one thing and having a plan or knowing your options, which can include refinancing could include, you could downsize. I mean, think of, think of the potential. If your house goes down in value, maybe you can't refinance. You're a little priced out at the moment. Would it make financial sense to rent out that residence and maybe downsize and buy oh, that's creative. Else? Yeah. Now you're because rents are still really portfolio. high. Rents right are now. still really high. Rents like rarely yeah. go down. You know what I mean? Yeah. Over time, they're always going up. So you could rent it out, buy something new and downsize, which theoretically, if you lost value in your house, you're buying something else at a discounted rate. And over a long enough timeline, both of those become worth money or worth more. What's the, um, when I bought my first condo, we had a, um, a subcharge on there, which was PMI. And I don't remember what the percentage was, but that also helped putting in more money into the equity of your house, remove the PMI, private mortgage insurance. Private mortgage, is that what it is? Private mortgage insurance. Um, yeah. And that helped to reduce my monthly payment. Um, so I was always looking at as it was going up to refi and get that to drop off too. Yeah, you take advantage of the equity part of it. Mm -hmm. And that changes. Yeah. There's there's like, again, there's so much within that. Um, even ours, I think our PMI drops off next year. Oh, good. Um, and it was very low to begin with. I mean, it's not a, I think that's a, Subtle misconception. I won't get too much into the lending part since I'm not a lender um, and I don't want to sound like an idiot, but you know, mortgage insurance amount changes. So if you're using a little Zillow calculator and it's just like, nope, you're definitely going to pay 300 a month. That's not always right. the case because it's right. you know, risk-based um, or equity-based. You can utilize equity versus 20% down. You can buy out mortgage insurance up front, yeah. which might be a good long-term play. There's always kind of a math equation in there where you can add time over how much monthly versus a, a bulk, but it's like a bunch of options like that, you know? And I think that's, I think part of the hard part is people don't talk to a lender soon enough until they found a house they want. And now it's their right. time. Right. And now they don't realize that lender is a little strapped on time to explain all of these options, give you time to process that because now you're dealing with the inspection portion, getting into the appraisal. Right. Chances are you're just taking whatever sounds best monthly. That's what I know. Like most of all, twenty things going on. Yeah, um, give me the best price and the cheapest rate. Yeah, versus yeah. talking to a lender a couple months ahead of time and just having that strategy and saying, okay, well, here's what I here's ideally what I want down monthly to totally pay. 
you might then be able to explore options of, okay, well, if you buy down your mortgage insurance on this one, here's what you're looking at. If you're now we're getting back into a market where we might be able to get more buyer concessions again. Right. In the back end. So now, yeah, so now you're saving some cash at the closing table. You might be able to put that towards your loan. Maybe you buy it down a point. Maybe mm -hmm. wow. a ton of options. You just, it, you have to start early enough to know them all and, and understand what they mean, which is, you just rarely see, you know, I think it's intimidating. I think, I mean, I know it's intimidating, the lending process. For sure. Yeah, I mean, you're just looking, like I said, if I was doing it, I would just look for the lowest rate, lowest lowest monthly payment um, outside of all these other different potential strategies that exist. Yeah. Um, so that's good uh, Good advice on, you know, playing defense of something you already own. Um, but as, you know, the total buzzword right now is the market shift or the market's changing. Um, so given the current market conditions, how are you advising your buyer clients and how are you helping your clients win in this market, um, making a decision that they can, you know, sleep with at night? Um, great question, because now the advice has totally changed. Yeah. Um, and I kind of like it a little better than I was having to advise a year ago. Right. With, you know, against 50 offers. Sure. Um, I think Getting now over asking, uh, like you said, waving appraisals, wave maybe, inspections, waving inspections, appraisals, you give up your right arm. That's tough to advise. Tough to advise on that. Well, you got it in writing, of course, but of course. No. yeah. Um, so now, I mean, we're shifting again. I feel like this was we're shifting back to a timeline of kind of 2019, where I felt like it was strong but consistent. Okay. And as a buyer, I mean, something's most likely or potentially not going to fly right away off the market right? You still want to be quick if it's something you absolutely love, but um, you know, if it's something that's a maybe, we're seeing a lot of price reductions, we're seeing a lot of, make sure you give yourself time and you can see a lot of houses. I mean, I used to do tours, we'd go and see 10 to 50 houses, something like that. Yeah. Wow. Because by the time you want to make that decision, you want to be sure that you've seen everything you want. You want to know what you're looking for. You start learning little pockets and areas. Hmm. Um which I always forget. I obviously we see so much of the valley. <clears throat> Some people don't know what's you know, the difference of South Scottsdale to Biltmore. Like I don't I don't hang out in Biltmore very much. Got it. Go oh, like yeah, but those are so close. Maybe that's so you the went, area you want to be. You shifted from being just a facilitator of the deal back to being a little bit of a market expert and a tour guide of the city, especially if they're not familiar with that or introducing them to different houses and opportunities. We have the time to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, which was, I mean, that was going on the last couple of years still, I think, because especially you said like area expert and, and tour guide, because people were having to look out of their comfort zone a little bit, mm -hmm. you know? I had a lot of, I had a lot of clients who were starting to get priced out of their desired areas. So what's the next move? And so I'd have to take them into pockets that they might not know about in their price range. Still good. Help them to fall in love with it. Yeah. And I like that. Yeah. I love being a little tour guy. For sure. Yeah. I miss, you know, we, I don't, I don't know that I've done it even since COVID, but I loved getting people in my car, clients and driving around and being able to point out places we go, places we've gone, you know, you get a random story in here or there. Uh, I love that. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I think that's great. Yeah. And that, I, that's actually a perfect segue into um, oh. how do you build successful client relations? That was going to be my next question. And it sounds like you just nailed oh, is it. That it. Yeah. That's part of it. Yeah. Um, I like making friends. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. Even if it's, even if it's just friends for, you know, two or three months while we're working together. Obviously, I keep up those connections later and try and stay in their lives at a professional capacity. But um, I feel like I get pretty close to a lot of clients because I like their story. I like, you know, you learn a lot about them. I like to share about me. And I like cultivating kind of that relationship. Like I want clients to feel comfortable calling me about anything. You know, they've got a weird question. Who do I call or text? Just, yeah, reach out to me. That's what I do. Interesting. Yeah, I like that. And I think that, I mean, obviously that's going to help 
business wise, from a referral standpoint, from a, you know, uh, keeping the relationship alive to the next transaction. But I just like working with people. And so I like building that relationship and, and figuring out who they are. Cause then I care. That's, I mean, at the end of the day, like I care about whether or not they're getting a good deal, getting a good house. I feel confident about being honest. Mm-hmm. You know, I worry that a lot of agents might or, and probably do tell their clients what they want to hear, you know, right. or they're transactional and they just want that to be done. And it's nice to be honest and deliver bad news sometimes, you know, or honest feedback of like, I don't know that this is the house for you and here's why. And they might not want to hear it and it might lead to us looking at 10 more houses. But ultimately I don't, you know, I care. I like don't want them to be stuck in a crappy house or something they don't love because they got, you know, people got that over the last couple of years, people got jittery. It was like, if I can get this house, I'll just take it. I'll just take it. Yeah. Like you said, I don't want that regret later, but. So that circles back. Um, I mean, that answers the question with how you help your clients win is, is you become personally invested in their success and story. Um, yeah. I think that's really cool. What, um, what also helps you to differentiate yourself in a in kind of a crowded market? Uh, I think the number in Phoenix is somewhere around, is it 75,000 real estate agents? Maybe maybe even yeah, a little bit more. We'll, yeah. Maybe a little less. Um, and granted, not all of them are 72. active, but um, not active in their primary career, but this is your primary career. Um, so what, what do you do to kind of different yourself, different your, differentiate yourself? Um, I, I mean, it all still kind of wraps into that idea of, of being friends and being honest because it, I feel like there's a lot of agents that have up a, maybe a facade a little bit. Okay. Right. And it's business to them or, you know, they're doing their thing. I think there's something in it that we do that's a little more personal. I just want to, you know, I kind of, if you don't want it to be personal, we don't gotta, we don't gotta talk. Yeah, sure. (laughs) We don't gotta be friends. Um, But I think, I think being yourself and being honest, you know, when I look at other agents that I look up to and respect and, you know, follow on social media and I track kind of what they're doing, they're always the ones that are, that are honest and open and, they're, they're who they are, right? They convey out to the world who they are. They're transparent and they're just genuine. And I love that. Yeah. And it might seem weird and it's maybe not for everybody, but they've got a niche of like, you know who they are. You know who that agent is, you know what they stand for. And not everybody's going to use them, but the people who do will probably use them forever, you know, and That's they'll build a comfortable niche. And I look up, I look up to a lot of those agents because of that, you know, and they're different. There's, there's not even two that are the same. It's, it's unique and they're doing their own thing, but they're passionate about it and you can tell they care. And, um, again, I think just being genuine is, is such a big milestone and that you can hit as an agent long-term. It's killer. It's great yeah. advice too. Um, you're a business owner, um, and I'm a business mm-hmm. owner, and we've we've talked about this a lot. Um, and part of being a business owner, in in some aspect, is is it can be a little bit lonely when things are hard. Um, you know, you don't have the resources to kind of talk it out, and that's why I value our our friendship and partnership is because I can call you and we can work through ideas and Same. and um, improve our businesses together. Um, but who else, and I'm sorry, I'm going back. I'm, I'm not saying that my life is lonely. I'm just saying that portions of owning a business are, are you lonely. okay, bro? Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> of course I'm okay. We'll talk um, after this. <laughs> but <laughs> who, who else do you call when you're feeling stuck or unmotivated or uh, what kind of keeps you moving forward and, and getting bigger and better and, and ideas um, growing in that respect? Um, um who keeps you on path? Jeez. Still, still the partners I talked about earlier. I'm pretty close yeah. with all these guys in the industry and that always helps 
especially in other elements, right? Like um, my, my title guy that I work with now is a super go-getter and he is constantly trying to think of newer and innovative ways specifically to help, I mean, to grow his business, but through his, he has to grow his business through us, through agents. Yeah. Yeah. So he's always thinking of new ways so I can call him. And I think at any given point, I'll have half a dozen ideas for what I should be doing or could be doing and how he can help to a point that I'm like, shoot, you're, you're just automating everything for me. I love it. Like we're making it happen. Yeah. Um, that's really inspirational. I talk to my wife a lot, obviously just event mm. or discuss things. She's got a pretty savvy, uh, business mind as well. Um, and just, and it's a refreshing, like outsider, you know, someone who's not in the industry, she's able to kind of come in and say, what about, it brings me back to earth a little bit, you know, gets out of my head. Sure. Um, she's a big one. Obviously we talk a lot about business right. and that's, that's big. I talk to my parents a lot, mm. you know, they've, they've always kind of been pretty entrepreneurial and, um, like I said, into real estate and they are always pushing for like a new venture or something different, like constantly stepping out of their comfort zone for things to an extent that sometimes I'm even like, are you sure you know? <laughs> you got to bring like, them back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, let's talk about your business. Like what's going on here? Um, but that's inspiring to see. It's always like, am I, sure. just, you know, am I just stuck? Am I like baseline or am I continuously trying to pull, you know, push the needle a little bit? Um, and just get better, get educated on different things. There's so much more you can do in this industry and with a business, you know, so we pulled on our first teammate last year. That was a good step. Yeah. Um, and I'm, you know, so now this year I'm starting to think of what's, what's the next step. Is it more agents? Is it transaction coordinators? Is it, sure. you know, virtual assistants, things like that. Um, and it is a little bit of a lot when you're starting to think of how much you want to serve your clients. And that's one aspect versus how much you need to run your business to retain and get new clients. Yeah. But those are, those are my go-tos. And as you're, as you're structuring that business, you know, the next move you have, you have your other teammate on there. Um, who are you looking for inspiration? So to build that structure, do you have mentorship groups or, or coaching groups that you're a part of uh, experience in the past? Is this from your retail management days, that type of structure? Um, no, I don't. I mean, structure wise, a lot of it's, I mean, I saw, I was on a team before at Coldwell Banker, sure. So I saw some of that, um, yep. which I think is great for a new agent, especially. And I had kind of a five to seven year goal of starting my own team. Mm -hmm. which I was like right in line with. And that was nice though, because I was able to see what worked that I liked that fit with my, right. my brand and strategy and kind of my ethos uh, and what I didn't, you know, things that I wanted to avoid, which doesn't mean they weren't working on the other team. I just didn't want to do them. Right. Um, so all that was good. As far as mastermind stuff, I mean, I look at a lot of other agents, I'm, you know, with my home group now, and there's a lot of sure. teams on there and a lot of, personal branding that goes on. So I look to a lot of those that have been successful and the structure of their teams, um, if they have them or how they're doing those and kind of their business. Um, one guy that I, we've been doing, uh, he works with the lender partner that I've got, Aaron Hodson at mm -hmm. Selwell. I don't know if you've heard of him. Um, mm -hmm. He's a New Zealander who was uh, wildly successful in Australia okay. and has since sold his brokerages and businesses. Now he does coaching and um, advisement and stuff like that. Okay. So I've gone through one of his programs and do some of his coaching stuff. And he is, he's got some of the best advice I think I've ever heard and some of the best insight because he was, he was an agent who was just him and he found one partner who didn't sell houses. It was just his assistant. Um, and together we're selling, you know, hundred houses a month kind of thing. He had well, this ridiculous market share of, of his pocket, but, um, but I like him a lot. Cause a lot of other coaches, you know, are, uh, not to name Tom Ferry's names, you know, <laughs> um, but you're like, you, you, you didn't sell houses. You, I don't, I don't know. You're giving me this 
here's what you should do and here's why he's a little more like here's what i did maybe you don't even want to do it i don't know but here's what you need to do because i've seen it and i've seen it right. with different agents and i've seen it over here um and he's a little bit more i mean some of it's like hits you in like the life coach way mm. versus specific business it's like don't you don't need to implement this just because i said it but but find your own thing to implement because here's why oh, interesting um or even just a lot i think one of the best things uh he had ever said he's like a lot of agents want to want to be real estate agents but they don't want to do the work mm. And quite specifically in the way of like, you know, we sit there and on a day to day, we write out like our list of things we're doing and we feel accomplished, we check them off. And it's like, but how many of those were just to feel like we were an agent, like we were doing what we should be doing right? versus actually selling homes or acquiring clients, meeting clients, building a pipeline? Like, was any of that actually benefiting your business or did you just feel like it was make what made you an agent the steps to make you an agent yeah that's uh what you're hitting is busy versus productive are you yeah yeah are you yeah, filling exactly. your schedule with stuff that's going to convert or are you are you filling your schedule full of stuff so that you can rush from a to b to c and yeah. feel busy um and, and it's funny really, when he was yeah when he was ahead. talking about that uh you see the room almost split of people who are like kind of offended and are like, well, that's not me. <laughs> and the other half that are like, oh, sh I need to, I need to really look inwardly here at myself. <laughs> and I definitely do that. And you've kind of pegged me out of the crowd here. Yeah. <laughs> but there You're are definitely there a lot. Deleting your appointments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, scratching off the list. Like, oh God. Uh, and, but yeah, there's some people who are like, no, that's that's not me. I don't do everything. You know. It's like, oh, it's all progress. You know. I mean, you gotta you got to see the the negative things you do to recognize how you can do the positive stuff. So, I mean, in reality, right. It, you have to have a balance of that because you can't go a hundred miles an hour all the time. You can't go zero miles an hour with, with no um, product, real productivity. So did you just hearing that, did you kind of move the mean a little bit and, and find more things to be productive or did you, um, did you take the advice and did it, you know, um, burn a fire for a little bit and shift back or, or what have you. Cause I, um, I feel like if you go hundred miles an hour, you're, you're going to fizzle out. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. it was more, for me, it was more of just looking at what I was doing, Yeah. you know? So every kind of day, every kind of action questioning, is this mm -hmm. busy work? You know, is this busy or is this productive? Got it. And you could still get the busy stuff done, but that's obviously not a priority. And you need to start shifting those priorities a little bit, shifting your schedule um, or just, or just crossing it off. Just going, honestly, that just, that doesn't actually help anything. Right. I'm wanting to do it maybe because it's the easy thing to do or the first thing you think of, you know, like that's what you've always done. So we go back to comfort and what we know versus maybe the things you don't want, like, geez, I got to really do a, do a little cold calling on some past leads. Sure. You know, that can get pushed off forever is kind of an example. Um, or instead we're like, why don't I just do a social media post? Yeah. Why don't I just post a some tile with my feet? <laughs> sounds good. I'll put that on the list today when really that's, you know, is that acquiring new clients or is that branding? And I can put that further down the list. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's really just a little, I took it as an introspective item to item evaluation, you know, a lot of self-evaluation. You're into that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Constantly. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's important, you know, there's the, and you have to track it too, um, to really find out what your metrics are. Cause if you're not, you know, you could think a social media post and it probably does, but you could think that one moves the needle. Um, and it's really not just one sporadically. It's probably one on a structured plan so that you can really be productive with it. Um, but if you're not measuring that, you, you have no clue what the real impact is, um, yeah. and where I mean, it comes a, from and asking those questions. That's a huge piece with, with branding, <clears throat> you know, is consistency with anything yeah. with, and with any business in any market, 
if you're not consistent, then that's an unsuccessful brand. And anyway, yeah. you know, if you think of McDonald's, you know, you're loving it. Like yeah. that's right there. Cause they've done it for 20 Forever. years now, 50, you know, like, yeah. And that drilled in your brain. It's, yeah. It's not the catchiest jingle in the world, but they did it a thousand times, you know, right away. So now they don't have to. And now but they, they do, have to. but they keep doing it. I, yeah, I don't know when the last time I posted one of those feet tile photos was, and you, you know, that's the first thing you brought up. <laughs> that's, that's branding right there. That's successful. It's memorable. Yeah. yeah. It's memorable. I, I, I tell people that, um, that in our business, we work closely with real estate agents and, and I probably follow more real estate agents than most in the Phoenix market. Um, and I can see things that, um, are replicating replications of other people. And I can see things that are unique because if I look on my feed for 15 minutes, if I see the same 20, 20 messages or same pictures, then I can see it. And it's when something pops out that's different and unique. And then they go with that. Um, so I think it's, it's one of those that's unique. So nobody out there steal it. Yeah. <laughs> it's John's. <laughs> um, Let's shift gears into just a couple quick home inspection questions because I want to oh, um, wow. be respectful of your time and I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, but as a buyer's agent, um, what do you like the most and what do you like the least about home inspections or home inspectors? Mm -hmm. um, so what do I like the most? Do you say most and least? Most and least, yeah. Most, uh, <laughs> most <laughs> I love... Uh, it, it's if you're third right which we work together you're my go-to yeah. um so i know what i'm getting for my clients mm -hmm. but it's thorough it's a lot more thorough i think than they imagine okay. and i try and prep sometimes where i say it's going to be a lot of info and it's not all issues you know that you that are detrimental or going to kill the deal but you're going to get a lot of stuff you're going to get a 60 page report i think all that thoroughness helps build the trust level, you know, mm -hmm. obviously with you guys is you're doing the work, right. but also as an agent, having their best interest and in showing them, you know, I mean, once you're past the contract point, which you can do right away. I mean, somebody could call me and say, I don't have an agent. Can you write this offer for me? Right. We haven't built any trust yet. I just facilitated what they wanted me to do. Um, getting into the inspection portion. Now it's building that trust. Yeah. And you have a shortened timeline because they haven't jumped in your car. So you got to do it quick. You got to do it quick. And I think yeah. that's a big one. And I've noticed that. I mean, I think once again, I feel like sometimes it's good to be the one who's delivering what's seemingly bad news because it's honest. Right. You know, and right. if you're, if you're to get a really clean inspect, I mean, there's a clean inspection, but there's, you know, there's a difference between that and, oh, Hey, did you look at this? Oh no, I didn't look at that. Did you do this as an inspector? And if they didn't, you're losing trust, right? Mm -hmm. You glossed over and we didn't quite get into the real nitty gritty. And I think that loses a little bit of trust. For sure. So I love a thorough inspection as bad as it sometimes seems. Um, which brings me again, probably to my least favorite part about inspections, right. which is uh, that you're unable to be, you know, it's a, it's a difficult line of like liability and what you can or can't say as far as the severity, which you guys do a really good job of, of noting, like severity is going to be up to you, right. you know, a, a 20 year old AC unit might scare someone doesn't scare me. Who's the one buying the house, that kind of thing. Right. Um, and it's tough to, it's tough to go through some of that. It's tough to be, to have some of those conversations of like, well, here's what I would do about this or, because it's not, you know, us buying the home. It's it's someone else and their concerns might be a lot different than ours. Yeah, and their money. Yeah. And their money, yeah. No. That's so risk. what are some tips and strategies that you use to get past that, right? So if we provide a thorough inspection, um, you know, there's there's obviously an emotional attachment to the house. That's why they're there. They want to buy it unless they're an investor and they don't they just want to know if the cash flows. Different scenario. Um, but somebody who's buying a house to live in, um, what do you do to move past that hurdle? Because it, 
it can be a big hurdle. Um, and sometimes the answer I know is to find a different house, but not always, um, you know, the, the emotions can go up and then you have to bring them down and, and, um, hit them with some reality. Is that, yep. is that right? Or, yeah. Um, I mean, education and examples are like, I, I love examples, Yeah, which it's helpful that I live in a 60 year old house because I right. have a lot of examples. <laughs> um, similarly, like having done remodels and flips going through some of those. So those are a lot of personal examples, but I like pulling from past homes and past clients and saying, here's what happened here. Here's the situation. Here's how we dealt with that in the past. Um, and I think those are always, I mean, that's, the most one of the most objective ways to just present information is here is the experience I've had with it. You you can right. still decide whether that freaks you out or not, you know, or whether that's a deal breaker. But my past experience was this. Then you move into the section of like, what's our what's our step here? What are the solutions? I guess right right. Like, is it a home warranty? Is it are we going to the seller with this and trying to get a credit? Are we yeah. trying to get it done? Are we just biting the bullet and saying, if you really want this house, you're going to have to do that? Because there's some things, Let's, I mean, like AC, right? That's such a big one here in sure. Phoenix. Let's say you've got an older AC unit. We see this a lot and it's working fine, but it's, you know, last phase 20 of years life, old. Yeah. 20, 20 plus, right? Someone's scared. We can talk about like, hey, if, if the seller's not going to do anything for you, it's working fine now. You don't want to go, maybe you don't want to go the home warranty route because that's also a potential pitfall. Maybe in the summer, it takes a week to get somebody out kind of thing. Right. But if you pay to replace that AC as, a, as the homeowner, the new homeowner, you just increase the value of your home. Interesting. Right. Same with a roof. And that doesn't apply for everything. Right. But some of those major components that are usually the deal breakers. Right. Roof, AC, electric, plumbing if you get into doing some of that, now you're investing in your own home and you're improving the value, the long-term value. Because if you only own that home for five to 10 years, you're like, this is my starter home. Which is the in average. Five, which is the average in five to 10 years, you're going to be able to sell that house more easily for a better price because the AC you replaced is only five to 10 years old. Do you go out and get um, estimates? Do you, I mean, to help settle them, does that, I can. Yeah. yeah. Um, I definitely have some resources. I started working with a um, company so recently that I don't remember their name, but they're really, <laughs> great, that they're really great about um, providing <laughs> repair quotes, both for seller or for um, buyer integrity Binzer. There it is. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, they provide good really good, quick quotes. Yeah. <laughs> good save. I know you give them some points. They yeah. do. They do do a really good job. Um so they'll give good estimates or, I mean, you can obviously look up, it's, it's fairly easy on the internet to start pricing things out mm -hmm. um, and going that route. But I, I don't mind doing anything. I'll send articles, news articles um, to help illustrate kind of, hey, here's what this is. You get, you get into that with like, um, I don't know, I had a client rip up some carpet in a, uh, in a little closet in a 1930s house and find black mastic. Yeah. And they're like, uh, what, what do I do here? Yeah. And so I kind of walked them through and then sent them an article and was like, here's, here's an article. Here's a couple of videos. If you're going to remediate it yourself or get somebody or whatever, but here's some info. Hmm. Cause it's, and they got through it like right away. Interesting. You know, they handled it. And, um, but I loved that. I mean, I loved getting that call because I love yeah, catching sure. up with those clients, but then being like, oh, cool. You felt good enough. Just being like, what's this weird thing in my house? strengthen the bond, but then also provide a resource to help them solve a problem. Yeah. And I like that. I mean, I feel like yeah. that's, that's the part of the job I really enjoy is like helping people. Yeah, for sure. So it's nice to do it after a transaction. How about as a listing agent? What do you like most and least? I, I mean, same thing, least from the inspector side, if they're, in, you know, if they're inspector, if they're not using good old dwell inspect, <laughs> um, if their inspector doesn't maybe portray the info in a, in a way that I don't know, conveys properly, sure. you know, which I've, I've had inspectors I've seen do, I think so much of that on the list as the listing agent comes down to the other agent, 
like I said, like for me, I'm talking about experiences. I'm talking about solutions. I've had other agents who did not go that route. Mm. And I felt like a lack of knowledge on their end caused a lack of knowledge on the buyer's end, which sometimes you don't, you know, sometimes agent to agent conversation, they just let you know, like, Hey, I, I explained to them, but that's how they feel. Right. 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 And that's valid. That's totally valid. That's fine. Um, but I've had a few where it's like, is this really something you, you know, wanted to convey, or is this something you really want to ask the sellers to do to add some rock for drainage? Yeah. Here. That's oh yeah. You have a lot things. of things to select and you're, you're choosing a ton of rock, which is 35 bucks or yeah. 50 bucks or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Or they gotcha. just want you to, you know, just little thing, which is always, I mean, that's the subjectivity of, of right. like buying and selling a house, but, <laughs> but, uh, Sometimes I think I worry about that. I mean, I think about that in my head is, is this agent, you know, educating and conveying things properly. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. No. Um, do you listen to podcasts? I, I listen to a few. I'm not like a huge podcast guy, yeah. but uh, I listen probably the most. My wife got me into um, armchair expert. Okay. With Dak Shepard. Huh. Um not related to our industry, but they have, you know, weekly guests that are really interesting from all fields. Um, and there's just a good time to listen to. Dex is a really interesting person and he's like very open with the ups and downs of his life Yeah, and issues, which is kind of fun. Interesting. Again, just to hear someone genuine and like transparent, it's refreshing. Um, and I listen to the Motley Fool. Oh yeah, every once in a while, you know that one. Financial, yeah. Financial, yeah. I I think I've learned more about our industry through understanding big picture financial sector mm -hmm. and like overall markets than anything else. Yeah, I think um, just in those two. I mean, I wrote down an armchair expert, but I think it's interesting that you reverted back to that it it not being part of our industry, but I mean, in reality, there's so many successful businesses that are out there structured that you can, you can model your business, your real estate business after, um, or our, our home inspections after different companies, um, you know, aspects of Disney, as, um, um, elements of Starbucks, uh, Southwest airlines, all these, uh, really game changing, um, companies out there you don't have to just pull from other realtors you can you can zig while your your competition zagging or vice versa however that one goes yeah, um, that's it. but that, I think that's really important one of my one of my favorite podcasts is um, how they built this where it talks about um, it's a guy Raz NPR podcast where they talk about um, basically the the path of a business starting and they've had uh, God all these different um, guest members, uh, Chipotle founder, um, they've had the uh, springless trampoline founder, um, just all these different niches out there and, and their stories of creation and their elements of inspiration. It's really great. Um, Those are so, fun. Those are, yeah. I've read a few books in that. So Better I read like the, the Zappos one mm -hmm. from the yep. CEO of Zappos. Uh, yeah. What was his name? He just got into trouble recently, I think. Um, Tony, Tony Shea. Yeah. Um, that was a really good one. And again, yeah. about like company structure, uh, ima the Imagineering handbook, maybe that one's called about Pixar. Okay. How Pixar was started and got incorporated with Disney. And uh, that was a really, really good book. I really enjoyed that one. Really freewheeling, really wanted to yeah. Like, yeah, like get you involved in their thought processes. <laughs> well, that's good. My, my next question was share your top three book recommendations. So you only got one left. <laughs> oh, I only got one left. Uh, well, you can you can choose as many as you like. Oh, there was one. Um, Contagious. Contagious is Jonah Berger. Uh huh. So that was about um, how ideas spread, Interesting. and like branding and marketing and word of mouth. <clears throat> um, essentially, like what what creates a successful idea, and why. And he did a lot of research in analytics about what was shared this is you know internet internet era so like why things go viral 
Oh. He did a lot of research about like articles and what specifically gets shared the most and why. And a lot of them are very unexpected. Um, a lot of them are science oriented, which mm-hmm. I thought was so funny. Like uh, this morning, I don't know if you saw, now that we've got that telescope that just right. gave us a bunch of images, everyone's yeah. posting it and kind of sending it around. Sure. And I was like, how funny that, you know, and, and especially in like such a tumultuous era that we're <laughs> in right now. Right with a lot of bad news and bad things happening. Like people are just going gangbusters for, for some pictures of far off galaxies. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. That's like where he segues is like, Oh, that's it's awe. Like something yeah. that awes people is going to get shared a bunch. Something that's seemingly important that you would think it's shared a bunch. Um, you know, I don't know, political knowledge or financial stuff just doesn't people process it, keep it to themselves but something that really awes them that doesn't seem like it would be shared the most. Cuts through the noise. Cuts Interesting. through the noise. It's unique. It's uh, back to what we were saying. When you're scrolling through your feed, you stop at something that's different. Yeah, for sure. Um, that was a really good book. That was a really cool one for anyone who might struggle with like marketing or social media or their own branding. That's a, that was a really good book. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to definitely pick that up. I mean, that's, that's everything, right? Like those are all the elements you need marketing and branding relationship building to create a successful business out. out. And then once you have all that, then it comes down to execution and, and that's doing the, the productive versus busy. Um, where can people find you? Oh, Central Phoenix. So do you want the cross streets or? <laughs> Just throw a dart. <laughs> Just throw a dart. Yeah. Uh, we're most active on Instagram. So okay. Instagram, uh, Phoenix, Phoenix Desert Dwellings, PHX. PHX, yeah. Desert Dwellings. Um, yeah. Our website, phoenixdesertdwellings.com. You can create a free home search, uh, get a custom valuation of your home. Cool. So it'll actually send me an email and I will personally run through comps and a plan for you. Um, Personally curated by a human who knows the market. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Got the hoax hoax to it. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're, yeah. TM. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Facebook too. Facebook.com Phoenix other dwellings. Got it. Um, where else do people go? That's it. Just bother Phones, us there. emails, that type of stuff. Phones, emails. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Cool. Thanks for your time. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for listening to just another real estate podcast. For the latest episodes, please subscribe and be sure to follow Dwell Inspect Arizona on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. To contact Dwell Inspect Arizona, call us at 480-867-4599. If you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, email our team at office at dwellinspectaz.com.